think there's room to write down here. I can't, I'm sorry, I can't see you. Uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm speaking into a void. I'll have to do this otherwise. Is it possible to, um, oh yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so this is a, a piece I did about 300 years ago. No, um, this is a, a <laughs> I, uh, I, I bring this up um, because, uh, well, I, I'll show you some things that I think are interesting and uh, have pushed me towards the place that I'm, I'm at where with my, my process of, of making artwork. And then I, I will describe the process itself and show you um, a lot of the techniques and methodologies for, for growing the fungus. And then maybe talk a little bit more about philosophy at the end. Um, so this is the, um, the, French, uh, the French silversmith and architect uh, Messonnier, um, who uh, designed a lot of the, uh, the sort of in interior uh, interior forms as well as uh, became kind of the signature of the, the Baroque and bringing together uh, the artificial and the natural in a way that was seen as, as most beautiful and particularly for its destabilizing influence into the world and this, uh, this type of synthesis coming together, uh, a type of beauty um, after, let's see, after, you know, this 300 years, this fusion of the technological and the biological uh, was not seen as a progressive uh, advancement of, of human knowledge, but maybe was this warning sign of, of where we had come with this, this type of fusion. Uh, this is, of course, this image by H.R. Uh, Giger um, for the Alien, Alien movie, this uh, mechanized bio, biomechanical uh, type of spaceship. This, um, this type of you know, instrumental, instrumentalization of, of technology or biological technology um, as, as a vessel uh, and one which uh, you know, tries to eat uh, any, anything that might visit it, visit it and also itself goes to other planets to eat, uh, eat their, 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 <laughs> their biology as well, I think can tell us a lot about where we are with our biotechnologies and our own um, fears about this. Um, probably, I, I don't know what the general attitude here uh, is towards Dow or Monsanto or these giant mega corporations uh, that practice this type of genetically modified practices on this global scale. Um, but I think the, the, the popular consensus uh, in certain quarters is that they are this monstrous type of corporative body itself that eats everything and also um, you know, is transforming this planet towards uh, towards its own business ends. So um, with that as the, the preamble, I'd like to show you a little bit about how fungus grow. <laughs> so this is uh, the inside of a tree um, being eaten by a fungus. So um, usually what we, what we call a mushroom is actually just the reproductive organ. It's this thing that pops out uh, to make its, its seed airborne or waterborne or transported in some way. But most of the time the fungus lives interiorly or inside of the earth or inside of other organisms, digesting them or just living their lives. Uh, this, the, the, the mushroom here is this white material uh, that is surrounding the wood, enveloping it and digesting it using strong enzymes and oxidative compounds to break down the lignocellulosic materials and to convert them into, uh, into uh, chitin which is the polymer that the mushroom uses to construct its body. So you can take a small sample of this fungus and then introduce it into a pasteurized food source. In this case, these are wheat berries. Um, and after a few days, it will digest it. The, the fungus will colonize that material uh, and it will pierce every single cell in that wheat berry uh, and start to break it down. And so this is the, the, before, the before and after of this process. Um, mushrooms grow exponentially, so you can take a small fingernail clipping size piece of tissue and uh, within a month you would be able to fill this entire room uh, with, that, with that soma. Um, and it's a matter of actually keeping up with the organism. Uh, it's called a run when you grow the mushrooms. And I've learned that <laughs> you are actually the one who's running after a while. So um, inside of here, inside of these bags are this pasteurized sawdust 
which has the introduced, uh, introduced fungal tissue inside of it. And if you are buying cultivated mushrooms, um, oyster mushrooms, shiitake mushrooms, most of them are grown in this, in this manner inside of bags. This is a, um, uh, a scanning electron um, microscope image of what the fungus are actually doing. Uh, these are the cells of the fungus, um, and this uh, type of cross connections that you can see here, this type of fibers, uh, they, will, they will actually fuse their cell walls together when they come in contact with each other. So this forms this uh, strong uh, type of matrix, and then um, the fungus then will envelop, you can see here on the left, a piece of this, this sawdust, uh, and this is what's called mycelium, uh, which is when all of these cells grow together into, to make structural, structural forms. Um, and so you can see this, the outside skin there, uh, with this, uh, this orthogonal type of cross-lacing, and then you can see this kind of perforation on the top uh, looking into that, that matrix. And so there's really uh, no wood left. It's fully digested this. And the fungus will do 100% bioconversion of their, their material. So if you start with wood, uh, you will have fungus, complete fungus, uh, after a given amount of time. And this is uh, uh, grown from this bag culture so you can see the soma, which is on the bottom, this kind of uh, mycelial structure, which has eaten all of the wood. And then these are the fruit, the reproductive organs that are popping out on top. And then those fruit will disperse their spores into the air. So this is, um, I'm, I'm not going to show you things chronologically uh, or necessarily in a specific evolution, but maybe to just elucidate what's going on. So this is a type of mold, you know, just a, a form to cast the fungus into, just made out of wood. Uh, and this is after it has been formed inside of there. It's an instantaneous molding, so you can just push it out of the mold uh, right away. And then you let it grow for a few days, between three days and a week or so, uh, to allow the mushrooms to digest the material and bind it together. And then after they've grown together, uh, you can dry them out and cure them. And it's the same thing as drying wood. You know, once it's dried out, uh, it becomes dead and it's not gonna come back to life. Uh, and it has the, uh, you, you can tune this material. So in the, the bricks that I have outside here, they are, they're grown to a configuration to make them very much like a polystyrene uh, polymer. Um, and these ones here are a bit tougher. So they're like a dense, uh, dense foam or a cork uh, as an equivalent. And then um, I put a protective coating on them, you know, same as you would with wood. So this has shellac uh, if you want to use it for any, any type of functional purposes. And then you can process them like a composite board or wood, so you can do any type of, uh, you know, any type of wood tools that you would want on them. You can also process them while they're alive, and they have many interesting qualities uh, while, while they're still alive. So I, uh, this past year, I, I took up a project to grow locally grown organic furniture in San Francisco uh, using diverted, diverted waste uh, from the Parks Department and uh, other, other locations. And we used the, the wood here. This wood here is from salvage trees, ones that were knocked over in storms so that we could have a 100% a sort of uh, local production of, this, uh, of these objects. That is, except for the shellac, which does come from India. So I will <laughs> make sure to qualify that. They have a give to them, um, so it, it feels comfortable. And uh, you can, as I said before, you can tune the material. So the top of this has a, a nice give to it. So you know, it'll, fl it'll feel comfortable. And then the part where the legs are attaching is a bit more solid. Whoa. This is my studio. Um, so this is a, a, a uh, high efficiency type of filter. So it blows very clean air, which is a requirement for working uh, with sterile or, or close to sterile conditions. You have to eliminate all those microorganisms that Yuri was, was talking about from your environment. So uh, when I'm growing things in my studio, I have to uh, keep incredibly clean. Uh, and this means mopping from ce ceiling to floor. Uh, and anything that enters into this space has to be clean itself, so uh, including me. Uh, and I think it tells you a lot about our scientific condition when you yourself are the filthiest thing in the room or are considered to be as such or the thing that can infect anything uh, as, as this position. So it's, it's definitely entering into 
uh, a negative space or a dead space. Um, and even though it's a dead space, it's also a space of incredible potential. And this is, you know, in vitro space. This is the, um, uh, the Yamanaka uh, McQueen, this particular one. Of course, named after the uh, famous fashion designer, McQueen. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting down with your technology. And then this is the surface. Uh, you know, John Cage, um, who founded the New York Mycological Society, um, was also uh, an avid mushroom hunter. And um, I think this piece right here, this surface texture, was created by just this random droplets of water that would land on the surface of the, of the mycelium and would change its qualities, uh, sometimes to an insect-like consistency or into all these different types of colors. Uh, and absolutely through a random, a random process to create this type of biological painting. <laughs> the beast. <laughs> in, in, in 2009, uh, the Kunsthall in Dusseldorf invited me to uh, participate in the show, Eat, the Eat Art, uh, the 25th anniversary of the Eat Art exhibition. Uh, and so they asked me to grow a, a tea house uh, for this occasion. And so I grew about 600 uh, mushroom bricks uh, you can see growing here. And then just like masonry, uh, fitted them together uh, around this arch. made this uh, catenary, catenary structure. This is uh, my wife, Monica, uh, who was there with me and helped to serve the building as a tea to the visitor. So over the duration of the exhibit, the building was slowly uh, chiseled away and boiled down and served as a tea. Uh, it's, it's very good for your immune system. This is in fact uh, one of the oldest human medicines that we know about. Uh, this guy, Uli, who, the Iceman, who was found on the, I think, Swiss-Italian border, he had this utility belt, and on them were three of this type of fungus, uh, the, you know, this, you know, cousins of this specific one right here. These are the latest versions of these, these bricks. Um, this is a, what I call a polyomino set. Um, polyominoes are a tiling system for covering surfaces, and if you extrude those into three dimensions, uh, you can start to do space filling uh, in a lot of interesting ways. So with these five family members and a couple of variants off of them, it's possible to uh, create almost any type of structure that you, you, would, you would want. Um, one of the things that this fungus does, if you put it into proximal contact, it will actually bind to itself and form a, a cement-like like a connection of one to the other. Um, and that, that actually becomes the strongest part of the, of the material itself. So just by putting these bricks in contact with each other, you can start to assemble, um, assemble your forms. And the, uh, the set that I have here, this was grown to create this, almost like a Lego set um, using scrap wood, uh, using, they're grown to the standard American scrap wood of uh, like two by fours or one by fours, which are used in construction, but are often laying about. And they form this piece that I've had passing around here for you to smell and smell and touch. Is it, is it still passing around? Has everyone smelled and touched it? <laughs> Who pocketed it? Come on, keep it going. <laughs> Anyway, you can see here that it, it has a, a type of a press fit, so you can just kind of push together your pieces and they'll lock into, into a form. So again, like you could make your house uh, out of these type of things and just use these locking pieces of wood together uh, to put it all into a single, a single structure. Uh, 
I think that's, I think that's about it uh, in terms of what I'm showing you. I don't know where my, my time is. Uh, is it just about there? Uh, do I still have a little time? You don't know? It's good? Keep going? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll talk a little bit. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll bring up an image so you have something. Um, so I've been working with this material now since I think uh, oh, 1995 or such. I've uh, been growing mushrooms. My, my history of this came out of um, doing hospice care. Uh, actually, it's, it's funny. There's a classmate of mine here uh, who I went to school with when I was an undergraduate um, who can might remember these things, but you know, the AIDS crisis, uh, when it hit San Francisco, it raged, um, and it just killed so many, so many people. Uh, the school that I was going to, sometimes in your class, there might be 20, 20% 20 of the folks would be dead uh, by the end of the year, so it was definitely um, life during, life during wartime, and this was before there were any antiretrovirals or really anything other than palliative care for, uh, for these terminal patients. Um, and it was through traditional Chinese medicine, uh, actually, that I learned about this type of fungus and uh, its, its abilities to uh, enhance the immune, immune system. Um, and again, it, it comes out of this very long tradition. Uh, the name for this mushroom is actually uh, supposedly a name for the Chinese pharmacopoeia itself, uh, the lingxi or reishi. Um, so it has this honorable tradition of being a golden herb. Uh, that is, you can take as much of it as you'd like to and it will have no negative effects on you. Um, what else? Um, so I started working with this stuff, and it was definitely an aspect of thinking about it as medicine, thinking about it as a sculpting material. Uh, when I started to build this house, or plan to build this house in 2005, um, you know, I set out on this, I don't know, this kind of juggernaut, like without a, really an idea of if this thing, uh, this material would be capable uh, of, of being used for, for a building. But the more that I tested it, it had such remarkable material qualities that I kept on refining the process and refining the materials and, and doing more tests. Um, I'll be publishing, actually, a paper uh, this coming Monday at the American uh, Society of, of Composites uh, on the, the, the actual material structure of this. Uh, and the polymers that the mushrooms create are exactly the same as any other type of plastic polymer in terms of behaviors. Um, these materials uh, take about 10% of the energy and about 10% of the water uh, of other types of materials to produce. Um, and they're fully biodegradable uh, when they're done. So you can take this, if you don't want to drink it as a tea, you can throw it into your compost or just throw it out of the window of, of your car if, you, <laughs> if that's how you so choose to treat it. Um, and uh, in that time, uh, there's a company that has started up that's been uh, acting to commercialize this material. Uh, so I've entered into this very strange zone of maybe leaving part of the art world and entering into some uh, commercial type of place. I've applied for a patent uh, on this procedure uh, of creating these denser materials, uh, and I've also incorporated to start to uh, consider this as an actual construction material. Um, it ideally will be able to replace a vast amount of plastics that we, that we currently make. Now, this, uh, this version, again, like can be used for polystyrene or a lot of other types of things. Um, it's a very complicated issue. Uh, I would say that, you know, if you're an artist uh, or, I don't know, a young person who is looking to go into the arts, you should probably get a law degree <laughs> or, uh, or go into biochemistry at this point um, because it's, uh, I don't think you can be naive if you're going to be working in biological arts. Um, you certainly, uh, your, your innovations, if you do not um, protect them yourselves, uh, others will take them. Uh, so it's in your best interest to understand your legal protections, your, your business protections, and just your, your intellectual protections. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs>